Men are good, as are you. Welcome everyone, and I'm excited to tell you that I'm here today with Paul Nathanson. Paul has been has written some of the best books you will ever read. He and his co-author, Catherine Young, wrote, um, gosh, the first ones were 2006, right, Paul? It was uh, Legalizing Misery. No. 2001. Well, we'll, get to, we'll get to your book in a minute. But Legalizing Misery and Spreading Misery were the two in 2006. And guys, these are still hallmarks uh, of, of men's work. Legalizing Misery from Public Shame to Systemic Discrimination Against Men. That, and Spreading Misery, the Teaching of Contempt for Men in Popular Culture. I'm telling you, incredible stuff. And then came uh, Sanctifying Misery and Replacing Misery. And of course, Paul's own book, um, which came before all of those, Over the Rainbow, The Wizard of Oz. So Paul comes to us with with quite a uh, history. Now, please. Quite, I'm sorry. Hang on just one sec. Quite a history of writing some really important stuff, Paul. And, and I think most people out there who have been involved in men's work know your work and respect you and love you for it. So thank you for all that you've done. But they're not the people I need to reach. Well, hopefully we'll reach some of those and some other people, too. Just People call me names on, on Google, so I don't Google myself anymore. I don't <laughs> use social media. Yeah. But they still find ways of attacking. Yes. Well, we'll get you out there. Bob, I'm at uh, lectures. Because today we're going to talk about masculine identity. Masculine identity. And where do you want to start with that, Paul? Okay, first of all, I think we need to talk about what identity is. And, um, you know, the word identity is common now in identity politics. Hmm. And that is definitely not what I'm trying to, to do. Identity is simply, at its most basic level, the ways in which we are like other people and the ways in which we're different from other people. Because we're obviously not clones. Um, so I think that to have a healthy identity, you need to see your, you need to have enough connection, connectivity to see yourself as part of a community, but also to, to see yourself as having a unique or distinctive, um, place in that community. Yes. Um, now the problem with masculine identity today and there is a, a major problem yes um and uh, if you wanted i'm not i'm not a social scientist but if you want to take as evidence the um the high rate of suicide for example right which is four times higher than that of women or the dropout rate or the crime rate i mean these are all signs of people who have no investment in society. And in the case of men, I suggest that it's because society tells men that there's no room for them as men. They can be honorary women, which is to say either feminists or, or token men, black men or other um, members of marginalized communities. Um, but unless you're one of those, you are, you're basically a demon. You're the source of all evil and all suffering. There is no redemption because in identity politics or wokeism, your identity is determined entirely by your genes, by your genetic makeup. I you know that if that makes you black or Hispanic or a man or a woman, but that's what gives you identity. The only identity that identity politics cares about. Hmm. Um, so there's no redemption, no change. There's no possibility of dialogue because, uh, because wokeism and identity politics see the world as a titanic struggle between power groups. It's all of history is about jockeying for power. Um, so 
there's no such thing as uh, respecting people in other groups, unless, of course, they're allies. And politically, uh, um, women have thrown in their lot with uh, gay people and black people, and it's a sizable alliance. They don't all agree on everything, but it is a very major, powerful alliance. And men are just not there. So um, when I talk about identity politics, I'm using it as a, in a very ironic way. Because the one thing that identity politics cannot do ever, by definition, is um, help all people um, maintain a healthy identity. Hmm. All people. Right. Not by virtue of their genes, but by virtue of the, as Martin Luther King put it, the uh, content of their character. Now, I want to talk about uh, healthy identity, because not all identities are healthy. Right. You know, if you were, um, if you were a Nazi, uh, you could have a healthy identity, but the cost, morally and every other way, was staggering. Correct. But a healthy identity, I would say, is, I would define it this way. It's the ability to make at least one contribution to society that is A, distinctive. No one else does it, therefore it's distinctive. Uh, necessary for communal survival. And also um, publicly valued. There must be... Uh, because that's that's basically the reward. If you contribute to society, you are at least respected, if not honored. Right. So those three things must come together in order to have a healthy identity. And as I said before, that is not happening for many men. Yes. And Each historically, men, it has happened, though, hasn't it? Well, yes. I'll get, I'll get to history in a minute. Okay, good. But I would say that even elite men today are in very bad shape because the only way that they mm -hmm. can have a healthy identity is by claiming that they are honorary women. Hmm. Now, as honorary women, uh, maybe they expect women to pin medals on them, and maybe some women do, but basically the, the cost of that in terms of self-hatred is very, very high. Yes. And that self-hatred is what feeds into this, um, this mentality of shaming other people, ridiculing them, silencing, canceling them, because they are a threat. Right. Right. And their, grip, their grasp is tenuous on their, quote, identity as being an honorary woman. That's right. Hmm. And in fact... One thing that we found out in the past year was in a slightly different context, in the context of, uh, of the rioting, is that uh, even mayors and governors who cravenly prostrated themselves, literally on the ground in front of the mobs, got nothing but contempt. Right. So there's a limit to how much even... Uh, even becoming an honorary woman or an honorary black person or what have you, there's a limit to what that can achieve. Right. Yeah. So it leaves men in a tough spot. Well, it leaves men in a no-win situation. Right, right. And so the only, the only way to get out of that is, first of all, to do some homework and find out whether the charges against men are in fact accurate and they're not. Right. So that's one way of getting out of it. Hmm. But, um, but we need more than that. We need more than individual men, you know, reading books. We've got to get men talking and not only talking among themselves, but also talking with women. Hmm. Because, not all women, first of all, not all women are feminists. And even among the women who are feminists, not all of them 
are ideological feminists. Right. Ide ideological feminism, and there are various words for it. Some people call it gender feminism. But whatever the words are, that is a development that it did not, that was not at the origin of feminism. Feminism originated, modern feminism, originated in the context of the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King. But at that very time, within a few years, the civil rights movement was overtaken by the black power movement. And women at the same time began to use the same ways of thinking, ideological ways of thinking. And one of the chief characteristics of ideology is, well, what scholars call dualism. Dualism is a worldview in which all of history is a titanic battle of us against them. Hmm. Okay? We are good, they are evil. Um, now, That's the context in which ideology develops. And in spreading Miss Andrew, Catherine and I outlined, I think it was eight or nine characteristic features of ideology. So any worldview, any political movement that has, I would say, many or most of those characteristics, you're probably talking about an ideology. Right. And ideology functions as what I call a, a secular religion. Hmm. It does many of the things that religion has done. Uh, it confers identity and meaning and purpose. There are sacred texts and sacred places for, for pilgrimages. All of these things are things borrowed by political ideologies hmm. uh, on both the left and the right. Uh, they, they simulate religion, but it's, a, it's what I would call a fundamentalist version of religion. Because fundamentalism is basically, they live in a world of, it's a closed world. There's no way into that argument except through conversion. <laughs> so, um, yes. which, is better, which is better than some cases when there's no entry at all. Hmm. But, but conversion is the, you know, self-hatred leading to conversion uh, is the, the sine qua non of belonging to an ideological community. Yeah. And if you don't conform, then of course you become a heretic. Yep, you're out. So, um, so I, I want people to think about not just identity politics, about wokeism, because wokeism is a, it's a simple word and it says all, everything that needs to be said. Uh, it includes all of these movements. So part of wokeism is ideology. Part of it is identity politics. Part of it is postmodernism, postcolonialism, and all these academic uh, ideas that have somehow taken over in the universities. Mm. Um, and they are all. And, and all of these movements are are they're missionary organizations. They, their goal is to convert people and to transform society totally, not just tinkering here and there with a little legal reform, but to utterly change society and build on the ruins of the old one. Hmm. Now that sounds extreme and, uh, you know, I always get people, you know, raised eyebrows when I say these things. And, it, and, and I regret that. I don't like to be the Cassandra of modern times. I don't want to be the one who's always telling people, you know, the, the apocalypse is upon us. But I do think that uh, Western civilization, it's not just in the States or in Canada, it's, it's in all Western countries. Right. Um, there's a kind of collective suicide going on. Yes. It's devoid. It, it, Children go to schools, and, by, and you know that in California and probably other states, they have changed the curriculum now to suit what the New York Times called its 1619 project. Right. Okay? So all of American history is interpreted as the result of slavery. There's nothing else. That's it. <laughs> and any achievements are just 
either trivial or they hide an under a sordid underlying reality. Hmm. So it's that level of cynicism that is destroying would destroy any community, and it's certainly destroying ours. Yes. So the stakes are they're pretty high, I think. Yeah, I would say so. And anybody who says that, well, polarization is all Trump's fault, actually, that is simply false. This polarization has been building and building for at least 50 years. Yes, yes. This is not new. And all of these woke denunciations and proclamations, they were all common in the university world when I was going to university 30 years ago. Hmm. Um, it's just that they've gone mainstream now. Right, right. Which is frightening. Well, it is. You know, at the moment, we're all very anxious about the struggle with teachers' unions and whether children can get back into school or not, or for how long. Um, now, that's one immediately, uh, it's an urgent problem for educators. But that's not the only problem. The, the underlying problem that I can't imagine how it can ever be solved is that there are there are wokists, ideologues of one kind or another, who are determined and have been successful so far in destroying a curriculum in which they in which children are introduced to um, the heritage of great ideas in Western civilization. In addition, yes, there was plenty of uh, behavior that was far from ideal. And we have changed greatly. And that's another thing, of course, that, that the wokers miss. And that is that in spite of what they say, problems like racism and sexism, at least sexism against women, <laughs> have greatly diminished by every measure Yes. The only forms of racism and sexism that are still alive and well uh, are sexism against men, which is misandry, and racism against white people. Yep. I'll go along with that. And no one sees so, it. I don't want anyone in, I don't want anyone to, to watch this interview and say, well, you know, Nathanson is a racist, you know, he's He's not giving due attention to the suffering of black people or women or what have you. Now, actually, I have to say that that's not true. Correct. And I grew up with the sense of being marginal. For one thing, I'm gay. And you can't grow up being gay without confronting the fact that the world, by and large, is not. Yes. Also, I'm Jewish. Hmm. And I went to school. I went to a Jewish school. And... I'd say at least three quarters of the of my fellow students had parents or grandparents who had died in the Nazi death camps. Wow. So I'm not I'm not unfamiliar with these things, and I'm not unsympathetic. I'm just saying that wokeism is not the answer, and feminist ideology is not the answer, and neither is Marxist ideology or or. Uh, fascist ideology couldn't agree more and a part of the reason it's not is because the focused hatred on men and whites you know it's focused with a laser sharp intensity yes and you know even even five or six years ago people might have hated some other group but by and large, they didn't say so. <laughs> yes. there, there was still enough civility left that you... Let it go. People thought twice before indulging yes. in hatred. And by the way, hatred, I want to get to this, it's important. Um, people think that hatred is an emotion. And I don't think it is. Hmm. I think that hatred is a culturally propagated way of thinking, an institutionalized way of thinking. Yes. And 
the key ingredient in hatred is is malice. It's the urge to afflict other people. Yes. You know, so it's not just a matter of ignorance. Anybody, we're all ignorant in one way or another. I can't get into anyone else's head and really know what's going on. Uh, I have to, I, I take a step back. But ignorance is, is um, unfortunate, but it's not hatred. Hatred is when you say, I want to burn down that synagogue. Yeah. I want to kill those black people. Yeah. That's hatred. Yes. And what I find very dismaying is that people are saying that now in public life. Yes. And feeling justified. They feel justified. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And, and not only that, but of course, uh, they're taking active steps to ensure that um, the system is skewed in their favor. So not only through education, uh -huh. not only by changing laws, for example, in such a way that the basic principle of the legal system, the presumption of innocence and due process, that goes out the window. Yep. So judges are instructed by the legal organizations to uh, prefer to believe women. We, we start off that. by believing. So yep. there's no due process. You've already got the conviction. Uh, so this is a very dangerous yes. thing. It's no longer a matter. When I started this work, we were talking with spreading Miss Andrew. We were, we were really discussing what we called symptoms of an underlying problem. Yes. And the symptoms were things like, you know, jokes on TV and sitcom dads and uh, um, movies with uh, uh, male villains. Um, but, you know, the symptoms are much deeper now. I mean, yes. I realize now that that was, and that book was supposed to be the introductory chapter to a single volume work on Miss Andrew. Huh. But we had so much material uh, that, and we had to, we organized it in an interesting way. So we start off with the most trivial things, you know, laughing at men or something like that. And then each chapter ups the ante until at the end, we come to the dehumanization of men and even the demonization of men. Yes. Now, though, those patterns, uh, uh, I still see them in popular culture, although I, popular culture has technologically changed, and I don't have access anymore to many of the, the venues. Of, I mean, I don't have, you know, 500 channels, and I don't do Facebook, and I, you know, there are, but nevertheless, I do go to movies, I do watch TV, and I see these patterns being repeated. And the pattern is that when all the major characters of a, a, a movie or a TV show, when all the major female characters are victims of men, and also by the end, of course, heroic, because they have conquered the evil man. Yes. Um, and all the major male characters are evil. And if they're not evil, they're inadequate in some way. So occasionally uh, in a it's movie, true. you see a woman who's a victim and she has a next door neighbor who happens to be a man and he's very sympathetic to her, but of course he can't do anything. So he's inadequate. Right. right. And it's always the woman herself who triumphs and uh, that makes women heroic. And that's the big come on, you see, for feminists and or any ideology. On the one hand, they must see themselves as victims, because otherwise, why would they join a movement? Right. And secondly, they see themselves as potential heroes. Hmm. Because otherwise, you know, again, why stay in a movement which doesn't give you a, a plan on how not to be a victim? So it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. 
All of these ideologies focus on telling their adherents that they are victims of, of this universal and eternal plot. Um, and the only way to get rid of that, to, to rescue themselves, is revolution. Not reformation, not reform, but revolution. Utter change from the ground up. Yes. Yes. It's a mess. <laughs> yeah, it's a mess, but uh, and I certainly don't expect to live to see much of an improvement. I know. I feel the same way. I mean, to this, I have lived to see peace in the Middle East of all places. And but that's people trivialize that. They say, "Oh, that was just one of Trump's good days." <laughs> and then we have another phenomenon that feeds into all this, and that, yeah, and this is basically um, the contribution of pop psychology. Mm -hmm. um, but also, but it served the needs of women, and that is uh, the kind of therapeutic mentality in which. The most basic principles of morality are filtered through psychology. And the result is not necessarily a moral or just solution. Right. It just means this strategy makes me feel more comfortable. <laughs> and, and so comfort, comfort <laughs> becomes the keystone. And of course, the opposite of comfort is feeling threatened. Right. And so that's why people have slogans such as silence is violence or, you know, almost anything is violence. Right, right. A disagreement is violence. Right. A, a stupid joke is violence. Yep. So now we have countless students on university campuses. Uh, these are people who are nothing if not privileged beyond comparison with any other society in history. Yep. And they come to feel that their lives are threatened every time they walk out of the dorm room or even in the dorm room. Yep. Now, that is really, really sad, but it's also very um, dangerous because it manifests itself in a kind of hysteria. The other day I was watching some of the senators... Uh, I forget which one it was. Uh, it wasn't AOC herself, although she's certainly sympathetic, but it was one of her pals in the, in the squad. Maybe it was Rashida. Anyway, this woman was talking and in tears about how devastated she was by this, this insurrection. It wasn't an insurrection, by the way. Of course not. Um, by definition, it was not an insurrection. Correct. It was a riot. But she was, but this woman was talking about her devastation, her fear for her life. And AOC, of course, talks about the same thing, but she wasn't even in the building. Exactly. So, but you see, this, this, this therapeutism becomes infectious. It's contagious. It's as contagious as, as uh, COVID. It's contagious. That's true. And, and it results in, not in a fever, but in a feverish mentality, a kind of hysteria. Yes, yes. I've seen that. I've definitely seen that. So I don't, we haven't really followed a, a pattern here, but yeah, we I hope have. some of this. Yeah, we have, I think. We, now, it, we, we talk I about. I want to say something. Go ahead. I want to say something now about uh, the history of men hmm. in replacing misandry the top that we we look at the history of men and more specifically the history of perceptions of the male body hmm. and we go right back to the agricultural revolution 10 or 12,000 years ago yes. the end of the neolithic the rise of states the rise of literacy cities um, but also specialization. So, um, 
at that point, that was the first step in a long series of technological and cultural revolutions that have landed us in the at the point of that the male body is no longer uh, uh, a contribution to uh, to society. Right. Now, there's one exception. Um, not, I mean, machines have taken over. Women have gone out there. But there's one thing that is still um, male contribution, and that is fatherhood. Right. But if you look at fatherhood in today's society, <laughs> it is a ghost of what it once was. It has been so trivialized and so demonized so that you know fathers are at best assistant mothers they're there to help around the house <laughs> or at worst they're potential molesters they're what potential molesters they're right right exactly so that's what's become a fatherhood and we have at one point there was a small minority of women who gave birth without being married. And so the idea in the 60s was, why should these people suffer needlessly? Let the state take over and do the things that fathers once did. Now, you know what? Whenever the state takes over, trouble ensues. Because it's like using an atomic bomb to kill a fly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the real, and, and in this case, it was based on ignorance. Because if you ask people, what is the role of a father? If you ask men, young men, what do you want to do as a father? Well, they will tell you they want to play with their children and they want to, uh, and they're going to do the diapers and they're going to do all these things. And that's going to make them feel like fathers. In fact, that isn't what fathers need to do. That's nice to do, but it's not what fathers need to do. Hmm. And the role of fatherhood does not begin that in, with infancy. The infants are cared for by their mother. Um, I mean, you, you, you do have fathers who give them bottles. You have women who give the children bottles. But basically, psychologically, psychoanalytically, the role of a father begins as children grow up and begin to leave the home. And when they, in the process of leaving the home, they get father's contribution. Mother's contribution is unconditional love. Father's contribution is earned respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Children need to be able to earn the respect of other people. Otherwise, they can't yes. live in the world. Yes. So, uh, and I would argue that fathers do that even before the child leaves home. Yes, in the process. The yes. process could begin, uh, it begins with, I suppose, going to school, whether it's kindergarten or high school. Yes. So that's the process is beginning. But of course, it's all preparing ultimately for the child to become independent. Yes. Or at least as independent as any human being can be, which is not total. Because by definition, we are social beings and we can never be completely autonomous because we always need other people in one way or another. Yes. Okay. So that's another kind of lie that has been told for, for many years now. Yep. That the ideal woman, for example, is a woman who is completely independent. She does not need men or anybody else. If she wants a man, she can hook up with a man or you know but she doesn't need a man to need a man is that is a kind of heresy yes and at the same time this is happening we've got the research showing us how important fatherhood is exactly <laughs> exactly children without father fatherless children oh. are at risk of every conceivable social economic psychological problem it's true now, that's not to say that every fatherless child ends up that way. There right. are conditions. Some individuals are managed to, but it's a, a statistical risk, a high risk. 
it's to the point so now where they say that fatherhood is causative of some of these things. You know, I've never heard social science research talk about causation, but they literally say fatherlessness causes some of these problems. It's unbelievable. And no yeah. one no one pays it any attention. It's crazy. I'm not sure that I wouldn't use the word cause. They did. Because, McClanahan. Because uh, there are other factors involved. Always. Certainly one of the factors, and it's an important one. Now, so then, uh, over the past 50 years, we have had an enormous increase in the number of uh, single mothers. Oh, boy. Some of them are single mothers by default because their, their husbands or boyfriends have abandoned them or died or, you know. But there are, in fact, many single mothers by choice. Yes, and I did a working. video on that, actually. <laughs> and they say things like, I've seen interviews and I've read about this many times, and they say things such as, well, yes, I think it would be good to have a father figure in my son's life right. or my daughter's life, because, right. it, because fathers are necessary for both daughter and sons. Um, so um, their solution is, well, you know, uh, I'll try to find a boyfriend who will stick around for a while and be a role model. Right. Or they can uh, they can pick up what they need to know about manhood from uh, friends uh, or or other relatives. You know what? This does not work. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Fathers must be. Participants in family life on an enduring basis. Yes, yes. Now, it doesn't have to be a biological father. Right. Although there are some advantages even to that. Yes. But at least a, a permanent male figure within the household. Yes. Indeed. And we see very little of that these days, unfortunately. So the, the one factor... The one source of a healthy identity for men being fatherhood is really on very shaky ground. Yep. Yes. If we cannot manage to resurrect fatherhood, uh, we're in very, very bad shape. Right. Not only because, because the effect on children is a disaster, um, and not only because it makes life harder for women, but also because it feeds a resentment in men that in some cases, I don't know the proportion, but in a, a sizable number of men will rebel and they will become misogynist or they will become rapists. Or, yep. Now, I'm not justifying those things, <laughs> but I'm just saying I, this is um, this is a warning that if you treat people badly, consistently, for generations, they're you'll have hell fun. to pay. That is a lesson that history clearly teaches. Yes, Indeed. but of course, people, but of course, people don't study history anymore. No, they sure don't. They sure At don't. Best, at best, they study a kind of uh, ide an ideological version of history, in which everything, all of history, focuses on this this conspiracy. Yep. Uh, yep. So, well, Paul, it's been good talking to you today, and <clears throat> it's about time that we turned off. But I know people are going to want to have you back. You, you can just about guarantee that. I know the comments are going to say, have Davidson back again, have Davidson back. So will you come back sometime in the future? Of course. Because we've just started laying things out, and uh, there's more to do, I know. You know? There is. Um, there is. And uh, I think that uh, this format is good. Good. For me. Good. I think so, too. I don't like a format. I don't want a format with five people ranting at each other. 
No, no, and you have a lot to say, and you're very articulate, and your thoughts, I think, are you know good for other people to be able to absorb. So really, thank you very much for your time today. I'm looking forward to doing this again in the future. You know, I think we'll we'll have a good time doing it. Well, I'm not going anywhere in COVID time. <laughs> yeah, most of us aren't. Most of us aren't. So men are good, as are you, Mr. Nathanson. And uh, thank you very much. We'll see you all next time. Okay.